The subject of today's discussion is, of course, Isaiah chapter 5. God's vineyard and its fate, crime and its punishment. As we shall see, this is a chapter that is really loaded with motifs, metaphors, and of course, inevitably, we'll need to consider its message, both in the immediate context of Isaiah's contemporaries, and of course, for our purposes, most importantly, its message for us. The chapter divides into three major sections, as becomes almost immediately clear in considering the contents. So let's begin with the first section, which is the parable, the metaphor of God's vineyard. In verse one, let me sing of my well-beloved, a song of my beloved, about his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard in a very fruitful corner. And he digged or fenced it, and he cleared it of stones, and planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also hewed out a bat therein, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild, inedible grapes. And the challenge that the prophet now presents to his immediate audience, and now, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard than that which I've already done? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth these wild, inedible grapes, and after the punishment, the verdict. In verse 5, what I will do to my vineyard, I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up. I will break down the fence thereof, and it shall be trodden down, and I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor hoed. But there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that there rain no rain upon it. And then, in one final verse of this section, in verse 7, the synopsis, the meaning of the parable. Who is God's vineyard? For the vineyard of the God of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah, the plant of his delight. Now, the English translation here reads, and he looked for justice, but behold, violence, for righteousness, but behold, a cry. What, of course, is lost in translation is the play on words in the Hebrew that what God had hoped for was mishpat, which means justice, and instead mishpach, which means violence. He had hoped for tzedakah, which means righteousness, and instead se'akah, a cry. This completes the first part of the chapter. We will, of course, need to return to this first part. First of all, in order to try to understand why the prophet conveys his message through this involved metaphor, this parable of a vineyard. What follows, in a sense, emerges as a further elaboration of the parable. In just what way did the vineyard fail to produce the fine grapes that it was expected to produce and produce the inedible instead? What follows are six laments, each of which begins with the Hebrew word hoi, hoi, translated here as woe unto. It's interesting to note that of the instances in the Bible where this expression of lament, 
hoi appears, there are 40 odd instances of its appearance in the Bible, almost half, over 20, are in Isaiah. Here, we encounter again six in rapid succession. The first, woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no room, and you be made to dwell alone in the midst of the land. The wealthy who are buying up the lands, forcing the poor off their lands, and joining the houses together to give themselves larger estates. And God's response, in my ears said, God of hosts, of a truth, many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair without inhabitant punishment. For 10 acres of a vineyard, note the theme of a the vineyard again here, shall yield one bath, a very small measure. And the seed of a chomer shall yield an eifa, again, a crisis of lack of produce. This is the first hoi, the first lament, woe. The second brings us back to the theme of wine. Now note, the first specifically has to do with social injustice, the inequities of the rich taking advantage of and exploiting the poor. The second reverts to the subject of the wine, like the vineyard. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may pursue strong, intoxicating drink, that delay late into the night till wine inflame them, and the harp, the psaltery, the tabret, and the pipe, and wine are in their feasts. That is, they use the musical instruments for the purposes of their revelry, but they regard not the work of God, neither have they seen the operation of his hands. And again, the punishment. Therefore, my people are gone into exile for want of knowledge. We'll need to consider the connection between the drinking and the want of knowledge. And their honorable men will die of hunger, and their multitude are parched with thirst. And there are additional themes here. The netherworld has enlarged her desire. All the wicked will be descending there, and man is bowed down, and man is humbled. And in contrast, the God of hosts is exalted through justice. And God, the Holy One, is sanctified through righteousness. But the land is in a state of devastation. The lambs feed as in their pasture. And the waste places of the fat ones shall sojourners eat. That was the second woe lament. The third, in verse 18, woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin, as it were, with a cart rope. They're pulling on sin more and more. It begins with cords of vanity, little strands, but ends up with cart rope. And specifically, they mock the words of the prophet that say, let him make speed, let him hasten his work that we may see it, and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel grow in my and come that we may know it. We want to see these prophecies of devastation come true. That's the third, woe. The fourth, verse 20, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that change darkness into light and light into darkness, that change bitter into sweet and sweet into bitter, perverting everything. The fifth, woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. They're smart in their own esteem. And finally, the sixth. Very interesting, because the sixth seems to revert to the first and second laments. It begins reminiscent of the second lament, woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and valiant men to mingle strong drink, 
Remember, the second lament was also about drinking wine and intoxicating drinks. And then, that justified the wicked for bribery and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. In other words, again, perversion of social justice. Well, remember, perversion of social justice was the subject of the first lament. So one can't help but note here a kind of frame. On the one hand, there is obviously that aspect of strong drink on both sides. But in addition, on the other hand, there's also that aspect of social injustice that, if you will, frames the subject of the intoxication, the drunkenness. Evidently, the drunkenness is in some way connected. At the beginning, it follows on the heels of social injustice. And at the end, it is what precedes, perhaps, what causes the social injustice. After these six laments, we continue with the third major section of chapter five. If the six laments were, in a sense, an elaboration on how my vineyard failed to produce the grapes that were expected, but instead produced the inedible wild grapes. In other words, how Israel has become perverse and has not remained faithful to God's expectations. And those were the six laments, woe unto. The third section is an elaboration of the response of the owner of the vineyard, the vineyard's destruction. Verse 24, therefore, as the tongue of fire devours the stubble and as the chap is consumed in the flame, so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go up out as dust because they have rejected the Torah of the God of hosts and contemned the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore is the anger of God kindled against his people, and he has stretched forth his hand against them, and has smitten them. And the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were as refuse in the midst of the streets. It's interesting that this verse is cast specifically in the past tense as if regarding something that's already taken place. Well, some scholars propose that it is in fact referring to something that already had taken place. Note here, the hills trembling, the carcasses as refuse in the midst of the streets. Sounds like, of course, an earthquake. Well, we know from Zechariah chapter 14 of the devastating earthquake that took place in the time of Uzziah, the king of Judah, that is, in the time of Isaiah. Is the prophet referring to the earthquake? Perhaps. We'll have occasion to discuss the earthquake at greater length in the next chapter, in chapter 6, which may indeed much more explicitly refer to those events. At this point, I think it's important for us to appreciate that the prophet is deliberately vague. And that's an important element for us to bear in mind, because remember, the prophet is speaking to his contemporaries, but he's also speaking to us. To make the description of retribution too explicit, too specific, would be defeating with respect to what the prophet himself well appreciated was the ultimate everlasting impact of his words for all generations. In any case, Beginning in verse 26, we see reference to an additional dimension, and this too 
is expressed deliberately, vaguely, and he will lift up and ensign the nations from afar, and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth, and behold, they shall come with speed, swiftly. And there's a description of the enemy coming swiftly, completely prepared for battle. Their roaring will be like a lion, in verse 29, they shall roar like young lions, yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey and carry it away safe, and there shall be none to deliver. The devastation of the enemy coming up against the land. In context, of course, again, if we are to attempt to translate this into a particular event in the life of the prophet, obviously, the appropriate event would be the onslaught of the Assyrian Empire, laying siege to Jerusalem. Now, there is great emphasis upon the roaring and the darkness and the distress, not on utmost devastation, because, of course, Assyria did not destroy all of Judah. The siege ended miraculously with the 185 thousand soldiers of the Assyrian army dropping dead round about the walls of Jerusalem in a single night. As of course we know and we've been seeing later in Isaiah, we see it also in Kings. But for our purposes, again, it's important for us to appreciate the prophet is deliberately vague because he's not just speaking about those events. He's also speaking to us. And it is on that note that now that we've gotten some very general idea of what's taking place in the chapter, we return to the beginning. That is, to my beloved vineyard. The vineyard that, as of course we read explicitly in verse 7, refers to the house of Israel, the vineyard of the God of hosts. Well, the obvious question is, why didn't he say so? Why liken Israel to a vineyard? There is a very obvious answer to this question. Obvious in this case doesn't mean it's wrong. It does imply that it's not the whole picture. The obvious answer is, who is the audience to whom the prophet is addressing himself? Remember that Judah is, at this stage, overwhelmingly an agrarian agricultural society there are so many vineyards around it's only natural to express himself in terms to which his audience would be able to readily relate so their minds are always in the fields the vineyards the agriculture so the prophet speaks in an agricultural metaphor undoubtedly it's true and undoubtedly it does make it easier for people to relate to these words. There's even the possibility, perhaps, that this song of my beloved and his vineyard may have been based upon some kind of popular folk song that everyone would have recognized. In any case, we should certainly note that the parable, the metaphor of the vineyard, is something that we encounter repeatedly in the words of the prophets. Just to consider some examples, in Hosea, Hosea chapter 10, verse 1, Israel was a luxuriant vine, which put forth fruit freely, except here too, as in our chapter in Isaiah. The metaphor is intended to deliver a rebuke. As his fruit increased, he increased his altars. The more goodly his land was, the more goodly were his pillars. Also, objects that were used in forbidden rituals because one serves God only upon the holy altar in the holy temple and nowhere else. And similarly, in Jeremiah chapter 2, in verse 20, God speaks of what he has done for Israel, for of old time I have broken your yoke and burst your bands. You said, 
I will not transgress, but upon every high hill and under every leafy tree, you did recline playing the harlot. Yet I, continues God through the prophet in verse 21, planted you a noble vine. It so happens that the word that is translated here, a noble vine, in the Hebrew, sovek, is precisely the word that Isaiah uses in his description of the vineyard as well. And, of course, the continuation of the rebuke, after I planted you a noble vine, holy, a right seed, how then are you turned into a degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? And following such words of rebuke, also, the metaphor of the vine in retribution. In Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 9, thus said the God of hosts, they shall thoroughly glean as a vine the remnant of Israel. Turn again your hand as a great gatherer upon the shoots. Leave nothing behind. And a similar metaphor for destruction using the vine, we read in Ezekiel chapter 15. In verse 2, Son of man, what is the vine tree more than any tree, the vine branch which grew up among the trees of the forest? Shall wood be taken thereof to make any work? Or will men take a pin of it to hang any vessel thereon? That is, as trees go, the grapevine is certainly not renowned for its wood. The wood is weak. It isn't even straight. It really can hardly be used for anything. Skipping to verse 6, Therefore thus says the Lord God, As the vine tree among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel, because it's the only thing you can do with the wood, so do I give the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Again, the metaphor of the vine. Devastating parable. Perhaps the most intricate and best known of the parables that describe Israel as a vine is what we read in the book of Psalms. In Psalm 80, a very moving, heartrending psalm, one of the recurrent themes with which our excerpt begins here in verse 8, O God of hosts, restore us, and cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved. Because in retrospect, in verse 9, you did pluck up a vine, a vine, out of Egypt. You did drive out the nations and did plant it. You did clear place before it, and it took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with the shadow of it, and the mighty cedars with the boughs thereof. She sent out her branches onto the sea and her shoots onto the river. This is all the vine, which, of course, the vine plucked out from Egypt is Israel. And the psalmist laments in verse 13, why have you broken down her fences so that all they that pass by the way do pluck her? The boar out of the wood ravishes it. That which moves in the field feeds on it. And again, that recurrent plea, O oh God of hosts, return, we beseech you. Look from heaven and behold, and be mindful of this vine and of the stock which your right hand had planted and the branch that you made strong for yourself. Reminiscent of the metaphor in Ezekiel chapter 15, it is burned with fire. It is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the Son of Man, whom you made strong for yourself, so that we not turn back from you. Grant us life, and we will call upon your name. And once again, that recurrent theme, O oh Lord God of hosts, restore us. 
cause your face to shine and we shall be saved. Again, the metaphor of the vine for Israel when it flourishes and when it is stricken by God. So returning to our earlier observation, clearly we see that the parable of the vine, the metaphor of Israel as the grapevine, is something that recurs on many occasions in Scripture, which, of course, on the one hand, we will note, further illustrates what we stated earlier. This was an agricultural society, so speaking about vines and vineyards made a lot of sense, but at the same time, I said at the outset, this was the obvious answer. I think it's part of the picture. I don't think it's all the, the picture. I think when we appreciate the extent to which these parables, these metaphors are so involved and so specifically focused upon the vine, it's not merely a didactic convenience because the audience would more readily relate to vines and vineyards than other things. There's a deeper message here. I can't help but add, that's good because I suspect I'm not speaking only about myself in noting that most of us nowadays are not farmers, are not engaged in agriculture, and the metaphor of the vine doesn't necessarily speak to us in the same sense as it would to somebody who would be going out the next morning to work on his vineyard. But again, I think we appreciate that more is going on there. The vine, after all, figures prominently not only in the first section of Isaiah chapter 5. Remember, in the sixth lament, woe unto, two of them explicitly invoked drunkenness, the obsession with wine says something, doesn't it? I think if we're going to be able to appreciate what the significance of the metaphor of the vine is and why it's so important here, we need to consider at somewhat greater length what indeed is the significance of the vine and the vineyard, and of course, of its choicest produce, wine. So it's on that note, that I'd like to briefly consider the first instances in which wine appears in the Bible. Now, of course, an exhaustive review of all the places that wine appears in the Bible would be completely prohibited. It would take us at least days, if not longer, and we don't have that much time. But let's at least consider the first three instances in Genesis where wine appears. First, is in Genesis chapter 9 with respect to Noah. And it isn't pleasant. In chapter 9, verse 20, and Noah, the husbandman, the farmer, began and planted a vineyard. Verse 21, and he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. Now, exactly what the significance of being uncovered is is admittedly ambiguous in the text, but it certainly is a disgrace. And furthermore, it leads to the rather depressing conclusion of Noah's life, at least as described in the Bible. The last thing he does is he's cursing Canaan and awakening, after all, from this drunken stupor into which he had placed himself because of his inappropriate fixation on wine. Now, the second instance in which wine appears in the Bible is of a very different sort. This is in Genesis chapter 14. To place it in context, Recall that Abraham here has just returned from his battle against the kings. And we read in chapter 14, verse 18, Melchizedek 
the king of Salem. Of course, Salem is Shalem, which is the original name of the city, Jerusalem. Melchizedek, then king of Shalem, of Jerusalem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was priest of God the Most High. And the bread and the wine occasioned the blessing. And he blessed them and said, Bless the Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God the Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And so wine serves as the means for blessing. Note the contrast here. In Genesis chapter 9, wine was the cause cursing. No, cursing. Canaan. Here, through the wine, Melchizedek is blessing. The third place where wine appears is more ambiguous. It is in Genesis chapter 19, where we read after the destruction of Sodom and the other cities, Lot and his daughters were hiding in a cave because they didn't want to dwell in Sar, and the firstborn of Lot said to the younger, our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. They presumed that all humanity had been wiped out. Go, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve the seed of our father. And in verse 33, that's what they did. They made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn came in and lay with her father, and he knew not when she lay down, nor when she arose. And they do the same thing the following night. They made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him, and he knew not when she lay down, nor when she arose. And the conclusion, expressed in terms that are candidly almost nauseating, Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. Now, I say this passage is ambiguous because I must admit that in our tradition, Lot's daughters, while, of course, engaging in incest, were doing so with noble intentions. They really believed that there was no one left on earth, and this was the only way they were going to be able to preserve humanity. So they had good intentions. Well, that covers Lot's daughters. What about Lot? Nothing about good intentions for him. In fact, nothing about intentions at all. Simply, he knew not. He knew nothing. He didn't know when either daughter had laid down with him. He was in a drunken stupor. But one can't help but recall in this regard what we read in the woe the lament about the wine in our chapter, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 13. Therefore, my people are gone into exile for want of knowledge. Because when the wine goes in, knowledge goes out. And Lot knew nothing. So again, when we consider the thrust of these three passages in Genesis, the first is about wine being the cause of cursing. The second is about wine being the cause of blessing. The third is about wine, well, going both ways. For Lot's daughters, means to acting on their good intentions. For Lot himself, means to losing his knowledge. And this, of course, is, as in the case of Noah, the last scene in which we encounter Lot in the Bible drunk and unknowingly lying with his own daughters. So, what does this tell us about wine? Obviously, on the one hand, it is dangerous. On the other hand, it is positive. It's the means for blessing with Melchizedek. It is the means for Lot's daughters to act on their good intentions. Wine is, in a word, complex. It can go either way. 
swine can indeed be a tremendous blessing. Consider in Judges chapter 9, in the parable of Yotam, regarding the trees choosing among them a king to reign over them. In verses 12 and 13, the trees said unto the vine, Go you and reign over us. And the vine said to them, Should I leave my wine, which cheers God and man, and go to hold sway over the trees? I have more important things to do. Wine, cheering God and man. What does that mean, cheering God? Well, of course, the part about cheering God pertains to our devotion to God. Remember, Malkit said it. The agency of the wine as means to blessing. Moreover, using as an example, Exodus chapter 29, truthfully, we could have used any number of illustrative passages here because there are really so many. But this is the first. Now, this is that which you shall offer upon the altar, the daily offering upon the altar in verse 38, and included in that offering and the fourth part of a hin of wine for a drink offering, for a libation. In other words, wine is also part of how we show our devotion to God. Of course, God doesn't need it. But that is described, as it were, as cheering God. Because that is, after all, from our perspective, what God wants of us. Our devotion, our dedication. Wine is means for that. So, of course, that's the part about cheering God. With respect to man, we have an additional verse. In Psalm 104, in verse 15, and wine that makes glad the heart of man, making the face brighter than oil. Wine, as means for gladness. I'm sure I don't need to explain what that means. We all know very well. Wine is something physical, but it has a spiritual effect. It brings us to a different, we hope, higher level of consciousness. And consider in that vein what we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 7. Go your way, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has already accepted your works. This is a blessing. We unequivocally do not advocate abstinence. This isn't the message of prohibition, no drinking. Drink your wine with a merry heart. Once God has already accepted your works, this should bring you to a level of exaltedness, a level of happiness, a level of fulfillment. That indeed is the positive view of what wine does. And maybe in this regard, we should note further the emphasis upon the merry heart, the, the emphasis upon the gladness and happiness. It's certainly not a contradiction to what we already saw as exemplified by Locke not knowing because of intoxication. Because wine leads a person to function on a level other than the intellect, which may be good and may be very, very bad. If it becomes something obsessive, if it becomes an escape, if it becomes a shunning of the mind, it's bad. And indeed, in that vein, we consider the other side of this coin. First, in Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 5, Game moreover, wine is a treacherous dealer. The haughty man abides not, he who enlarges his desire as the netherworld. Desire, more and more. 
the Zaire has the netherworld. Does that sound familiar? It ought to, because in the same lament, the woe regarding drunkenness, we read similarly in verse 14, therefore the netherworld has enlarged her desire and opened her mouth without measure. Same idea in this passage in Chavachuk. And it is death and cannot be satisfied, but gathers unto him all nations and heaps upon him all peoples. Wine, the treacherous dealer. And similarly, repeatedly in Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink is riotous, and whoever reels thereby is not wise. Of course, it's not wise because it will undermine your knowledge. In Proverbs chapter 21, verse 17, he who loves joy will be a poor man, and he who loves wine and oil shall not be rich. That is, the loss of knowledge will even have practical consequences. You won't be able to take care of yourself. And similarly, Proverbs 23, verse 20, be not among the wine bibbers, among gluttonous eaters of flesh, which helps us, us to appreciate that wine is also a kind of representation of being obsessive about the physical generally for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty. And likewise, in the last chapter of Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 31, warning against the kings who drink wine and the princes who say, where is strong drink, lest they drink and forget that which is decreed, pervert the justice. They just lose their sense of knowledge. They lose their sense of responsibility. When the wine goes in, the mind goes out. And so, we shouldn't be surprised that we find in more than one instance in the Torah, warnings regarding wine. First, we consider Numbers chapter 6. In verse 2, speak unto the people of Israel and say to them, when either man or woman shall clearly utter a vow, the vow of a Nazarite, to consecrate himself unto God. What does being a Nazarite mean? Well, the truth is it means a number of things. But the first item on the list is, in verse 3, he shall abstain from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar of wine, nor vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat fresh grapes or dry. Nothing having to do with grapevine. In verse 4, all the days of his Nazarite ship shall he eat nothing that is made of the grape or wine, vine, from the pressed grapes, the grape stones, or alternatively from seeds, skins, nothing having to do with grapes. The vine is to be shunned because the Nazarite is consecrating himself to God. And that consecration expresses itself first, in refraining from anything having to do with the produce of the vine. But of course, that's not forever. And it's important for us to appreciate, it's not forever. When the days of his consecration are fulfilled, there is a prescribed ceremony that we read in the continuation of the chapter, at the end of which, as we read in verse 20, after that, the Nazarite may drink wine, and the vow over. It's not permanent. Of course, the vow of the Nazarite is only for the rare individuals who feel compelled to take upon themselves this vow. On a more general plane, we read in Leviticus chapter 10, beginning in verse 8, God spoke unto Aaron, saying, Drink no wine nor strong drink, you or your sons with you, not forever, but when you come into the tent of meeting, that you die not, that you are liable to death by the hand of heaven, if you enter the tent of meeting, if you enter the tabernacle, when in a state of intoxication, it shall be a statute forever, throughout your generations. So, priests, the Kohanim, are forbidden to enter into the precincts of the temple 
in a state of intoxication at all. But of course, again, here, it's not a prohibition on ever drinking wine. It's only a prohibition on engaging in the temple service in such a state of intoxication. There's an additional dimension, and this is intimated in the next two verses, in verse 10, and that you may separate between the holy and the common, and between the defiled and the pure, in verse 11, and that you may teach the people of Israel all the statutes that God has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. That is, this is not the role of the priests in serving within the precincts of the temple. This pertains to the role of the priests in being teachers, in being the interpreters of the laws of God in the Torah. And in as much as that second role is not unique to the priests, Indeed, by our tradition, this intimates a prohibition on anyone teaching, ruling the laws of the Torah in a state of intoxication as well. Why not? Well, of course, at this point, it should be obvious. Because while wine is a place, we're not prohibitionists. We're not advocating abstention. It does have a place. But its role, nevertheless, is going to be to shift us from that intellectual plane to a different level. Call it happiness, cheer, joy. It's not the intellect. When you are teaching the rules of God in the Torah, when you are judging based upon those rules, what you need is your intellect. You cannot be in a state of intoxication then. So again here, what we see is a complex attitude. It's not looking simply negatively upon the vine. And now returning to the metaphor of the vineyard in our chapter, of course we recognize that God wouldn't be described as having a vineyard if having a vineyard were regarded as degenerate behavior. A vineyard is a perfectly legitimate thing to do. Because after all, having wine is important. It can be used positively. It needs to be appropriated in its positive role. In blessing, in growing, in becoming uplifted in a state of happiness once God has accepted our deeds. And yet, it can be abused. It can easily become an object of obsession. And when that happens, even though God is described as planting us as a vineyard, because again, a vineyard is something positive, the vineyard goes off. Instead of producing the good grapes that should lead to the appropriate wine that produces wild grapes, that yields only destruction. Now, considering this, it may serve us well to briefly review what happens in the history of Israel. At the outset, in the first book of Kings, in chapter 5, verse 5, we read, And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree. This was all the days of Solomon. And of course, it's considered a blessing. Blessing to be under your vine and your fig tree. But that's only as long as you understand how to use God's gifts responsibly, in devotion to him, not in rebellion against him, which is, after all, rebellion against the good, against the right, against all that is meaningful in life. And 
when that sense of responsibility is lost. We read in Isaiah chapter 22, verse 13, I suspect is unwittingly quoted throughout Western society by revelers. It's important to see it in context. And behold, joy and gladness, slaying oxen and killing sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. What a bankrupt attitude. Utterly divorced of any sense of responsibility, any sense of propriety. Nothing matters. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And God's response, truly this iniquity, shall not be atoned for till you die, says the Lord, the God of hosts. Says you'll get exactly what you're looking for. Tomorrow you die. There'll be nothing left. And that was in Hosea, Hosea chapter 2, in verse 14, I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees. Remember the vines and fig trees under which you were sitting in the days of King Solomon? Whereof she had said, these are my hire that my lovers have given me, and I will make them a forest and the beasts of the field will eat them. And it's significant to note, one cannot help but connect these words in chapter 2 with the words in chapter 4. My people are silenced or destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you. That expression, for lack of knowledge, in the Hebrew, Mibli Hadat is veritably identical to the expression that we saw in this lament of woe, the second woe about drunkenness. My people are gone into captivity for want of knowledge. Mibli Dat. And in using much the same metaphor, when Jeremiah describes utter destruction. In chapter 8, verse 13, I will utterly consume them, says God. There are no grapes on the vine nor figs on the fig tree. The leaf is faded. I gave them that which they transgress. All is lost to them. And indeed, in the words of Isaiah himself, another woe to, a lament of Hoi, this at the beginning of chapter 28, woe to the crown of pride of the drunkards of Ephraim and to the fading flower of his glorious beauty, which is on the head of the fat valley of them that are smitten down with wine. And the consequence, behold, God has a strong and a mighty, powerful wind as a downpour of hail, a tempest of destruction, as a downpour of mighty waters overflowing that cast down to the earth with violence the crown of pride of the drunkards of the shrine shall be trodden underfoot. Wine has become an obsession, and by consequence, nothing is going to be left. And since indeed nothing is left, recalling the additional theme that we also saw in that second woe, that second lament, and man is bowed down and man is humbled, and the eyes of the lofty are humbled. We saw this theme before. We saw it in chapter 2. And man bows down that man has become humble, and you cannot bear with him. You shall not forgive him. Verse 11, the lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the holiness of man shall be bowed down, and God alone will be exalted in that day. 
For the God of hosts has a day upon all that is proud and lofty and upon all that is lifted up, and it shall become humble. I'm skipping to verse 17 again. The loftiness of man shall be bowed down, the haughtiness of men shall be humbled, and God alone will be exalted in that day. Recall likewise the theme that we saw in the second lament, that while man is bowed down and humbled, the God of hosts is exalted through justice, and God the Holy One is sanctified through righteousness. This is not merely a message of wanton destruction. There needs to be a rehabilitation here. You need to focus on what needs to be exalted and what needs to be lowered. Because an almost inevitable consequence of that drunkenness is when you lose the intellect, when you lose the propriety, the probity, the seriousness, you lose a sense of your own limitations. You lose a sense of your own smallness before God's word. And indeed, consider in that vein the next lament, the next woe in the prophet's list. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin, as it were, with cart rope, that say, let him make speed, let him hasten his work, that we may see it, and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come, that we may know it. Mocking the words of the prophet. This is a theme that, admittedly, we also see expressed in some of the other prophets. In Jeremiah chapter 17, in verse 15, they say to me, where is the word of God? Let it come now. Let it come now. What, you're impatient for destruction? The prophet says, as for me, I have not hastened from being a shepherd after you, neither have I desired the woeful day. You know it, that which came out of my lips was manifest before you. Be not a ruin unto me. You are my refuge in the day of evil. And likewise, in Ezekiel chapter 12, in verse 22, Son of man, what is that proverb that you have in the land of Israel saying, the days are prolonged, and every vision will be lost. Yeah, they said. Doesn't matter. The visions will be lost. Verse 23, tell them, therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will make this proverb to cease, and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel. But say to them, the days are at hand. And the word of every vision. In verse 25, for I am God, I will speak that word Whosoever it be that I shall speak, and it shall be performed. It shall be no more delayed, for in your days, O rebellious house, will I speak the word and will perform it, says God the Lord. The words of the prophet, after all, are words of guidance, words of direction, words that You'll only hear if you're listening with good judgment. And if you have jettisoned the intellect. Ah, eh, words of God, we don't care. It's part of the same progression. It is all, after all, part of that same progression. And by consequence, the next woe are the people who just pervert everything. They call evil good and good evil, change darkness into light, light into darkness. When you lose the intellect, you lose discretion. You lose the ability to discern one thing from another. They're not perverting simply because of a deliberate desire to pervert truth. They're perverting because they have voided their ability to distinguish truth from falsity. They are, the fifth lament, wise in their own eyes. Wise in their own eyes is a recurrent theme in particular in Proverbs. Be not wise in your own eyes and so on. We won't go through all the list of examples because of lack of time. But the theme of being wise in your own eyes, again, you've lost the sense of your own limitations. 
You've lost the sense of recognizing what you don't know. Of course, in the most specific sense, you lose it because you've become a drunken wretch. But it's not specifically the intoxication that's the issue here. It's becoming obsessive with materialism. When you obsess on the physical, you lose sight of what goes beyond the physical. And of course, the supreme irony here is that the wine should, ought to have, served specifically as the means to getting to that. The wine isn't simply the problem in and of itself. And of course, again, we reiterate that both in the relationship between the first woe, which was about social injustice, and the second, which was about drunkenness, and in the last woe, where the woe speaks of those who are mighty to drink wine, valiant men to mingle strong drink, and how they express their might and their valiance that justify the wicked for bribery and take away the righteousness of the righteous from them. Being obsessed with the physical voids that most crucial aspect of the spiritual because the spirit is most critically manifest in how do you relate to your brothers and sisters? How do you relate to the weak members of society? How do you relate to social justice? You need a mind for that. You need to remain focused. You don't need to abstain from wine. There's no message of abstinence here. Remember, God, as it were, plants a vineyard. But you need to apply it with probity, with limitations, with the seriousness of not going off the cliff. If you don't, then indeed, the words of retribution follow. If you do, then it's instructive for us to consider, by way of conclusion, the vision of the world of the future. First, in the words of the prophet Yoel in chapter 2, in Verse 21, fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for God has done great things. Verse 22, be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and the vine. The fig tree and the vine, again together, yield their strength. In verse 26, you will eat in plenty and be satisfied. There's nothing wrong with that. So long as you're doing it as the means, the continuation of the verse, for you shall praise the name of God your Lord that has dealt, dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And then, recognizing how not to and how positively to harness the wine appropriately, you shall know, not lack of knowledge, you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and I am. God, your Lord, and there is none else, and I feel also never be ashamed. And likewise, in the prophecy of Amos, chapter 9, in verse 13, behold, the days come, says God, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, grapes, him that sows seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills will melt. And look what they're doing in verse 14, when I return to captivity of my people Israel. They will plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as you remember how to use it and how not to. And of course, finally, maybe for us most critically, it's important for us to appreciate this isn't just about Israel. In Micha, chapter 4, we've discussed this chapter before. In the end of days, it shall come to pass that the mountain of God's house will be established at the top of mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills and peoples. All peoples will stream to it, and many nations will go and say, Go and let us go up to the mountain of God, the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways when we walk in his baths. For out of Zion will go forth the Torah and the word of God from Jerusalem. And that leads to, they'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. 
nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And the following verse. They shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the God of hosts has spoken. And likewise in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 10, in that day, says the God of hosts, you shall call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. Because once you've learned how to use this world appropriately, God gives it to you in abundance and in blessing. May we integrate the message of the vineyard and learn its lessons and be the beneficiary of God's blessings. God bless you.